Was ist denn das? Ein Überrobot. All right, let me reroute some of this stuff then. The horns are going to come out of five and six. The elbows are out of one and two, and the violin pits is out of three and four. Okay, I'll also reharmonize the elbows. Can you turn the pizzicato up, Bob? The pizzicato uh, precedes the oboe note slowly, uh, slightly, just by shifting the whole track. elbows down a little bit in relationship to the pizzicato. to a clarinet if these samples are on there I don't know where they are nope not <laughs> and we'll make him um, double the brass bring the pizzicatos back take this sound and we can split it in half we'll go like this first we'll double the second brass track and put this there we'll take half of it off so one walt will play back and the other walt will play with the other Part of this began as a human voice. Huh. Then you have a couple of waveforms in there that sound very close. There's four different partials all playing at the same time. And one partial is this. Uh -huh. One's this. synthesized violin mm -hmm. that's an FM timbre mm -hmm. so you can hear only three of them this is minus the grit You hear one of the pitches in there moves microtonally, and everything else moves according to the scale. That little... This has textures in it that remind me of John Cage compositions that I've heard before. If 
we want to have a piano doubling all of this, we just go like this. decide that none of that was correct and just replace all the instruments. If I were to tell you out of the pieces that you listen to where the material was derived from, you, you, you might, even you might be shocked to see how the stuff was arrived at because of the way that you can process data with that computer. It is unbelievable. This takes it uh, like a step beyond serial organization into, it, it would be a very technical description to show you what happens, but let's just say that the value of an aesthetic concept like the economy of means, which people often speak of in Stravinsky, where you know, they have these little cells of melodies that get moved around. The synclavier allows you to take that to a ridiculous extreme. I mean, where you can literally make compositions out of dust. Don't you? Of course. I mean, but like numerical dust. I mean, as I hear two glissandos going in opposite directions on a cello solo, yeah. how do you perform that? With the fingers. Yes. Let me show you my instruments, all right? Okay. Can I? This is it. Okay. So this is the, uh, the That's cello. That's the cello fingerboard? No, violin. Oh, <laughs> no. <The cello. laughs> oh, no. And so you calculated it on this? Well, yes, I put my fingers in. Okay, so if you're going to go in two different directions, the bow would have to go under the string, right? Like this. Yes. Two, the, the two outside strings? If you try and do anything that nobody has done before, basically you don't know what, how to call it, you don't know what to say about it, so you've got to invent a uh, little vocabulary for it and um, invent your own processes and invent your own rules. And the rules should be based on whatever it was that sounded good to you when you did that particular experiment. Because my idea is that if, you, if I can do that in a slow way, the virtuoso, the soloist, can do that fast, mm -hmm. you see. So all the bass is here. And even strings. Well, there's even a kind of a string on here, too, so... I don't think a person should limit himself to writing for a synthesizer, right. or a sampler, or even a live musician. I think that the ideal would be a combination of <clears throat> all types of resources. He's a talking to this wild cougar. And he's a saying zuki zuki in a deep tone of voice. What is zuki zuki? Zuki zuki. Now nobody knows. Well, let's go back to what is a melody. A melody is like a, in one way, it's like a word. You know, the whole melody is a word. The whole melody is also a complex waveform. Because if you look at the melody in terms of where the notes go up and where they go down, you could look at that as if the whole thing was a waveform. And Maybe it's an absurd concept, but maybe the human mind, which decodes all other waveforms, which are basically wiggles and shapes like that, in some way can perceive a melody as a waveform over a longer period of time. So if you take the melody and you, know, you, you see it going by like this, if you took it that way and looked at it end to end, you're looking through a climate. Mm -hmm. you flip it back this way and you're seeing it going this way. As it decays in time, as the reverbs decay, you're making um, harmonic statements throughout the melody that don't necessarily have to relate to the chord changes. And then you step back from that and you could say, well, if the melody can be seen this way, then in a much larger scale, the entire composition is a big word, a big complex waveform, a big climate. Now, all of those things have an effect on the human brain and on the, the uh, people's uh, 
it affects people physiologically. What happens to you if you listen to Beethoven's Fifth as a big climate? You know, da 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 da. It's a word, right? But then there's more. You know, and the, look at the whole thing. You get to live in that climate for the duration of the piece if you choose to do it. What does that do to you? Or what happens to you if you attend Lulu and sit through all of that? That did something to you, you know? Or, you know, for those lucky people who can stand to sit through the entire ring, you're, you're physiologically modified by experiencing this wor world. And we've seen what the results of that can be. It's the make it talk syndrome. People do not talk like this unless they are very sick. And that's the way m normal music notation is. You see, people talk with rhythms that go all over the place. So why not have melodies that have the same rhythms that resemble human speech? <laughs> ja viele Techniker gesagt haben, eine vollkommen neue Schwingungsform entdeckt, mit der man Menschen von hier äh, zum äh, Sirius schicken kann. Das ist ja gar nicht undenkbar. Das ist super. Dann wäre das doch ein wunderbarer Akt in meinem Theater, dass das ganze Publikum einfach mal für zehn Minuten ausflippt und einfach auf, auf, auf eine Schwingung aufmoduliert wird und die erscheint dann zehn Minuten lang auf dem Sirius und, und wird dann zurückgerufen. There's a place in France, where they have the ice show and it's got a 200 cycle hump in the room and there's a lot of curtains. And so instead of getting a slap back, you get a thud back from... And uh, I'll just keep it in the percussion so you can test that. Bewegung des Klanges und dadurch auch die Form der Räumlichkeit des Klanges ist eine neue Richtung in der musikalischen Komposition. I, I like the idea of brass instruments where all the overtones come to life in a place where the room is feeding something back into the sound. What a microphone does is it's a, a substitute for a human ear. Could be a good ear or a bad ear, depending on the quality of the microphone. You put the microphone in, in an ambient environment and you excite the air molecules in that environment. And if it's an interesting environment, it makes the, the instrument which is playing in that environment more interesting, more valuable, and it's a more memorable sample. So a lot of the samples that we have done here at this studio were done back in that room. Are you saying that the, uh, that Space in composition is a, is a basic factor? Always has been. For me, anyway. Right. So when you compose these... The, the, in, the excuse me. In mixing, that's called the back to front of the mix. In other words, not only do you want to have stereo like that, you want to be able to see individual uh, instru instrumental placement in the stereo spectrum, but there's the, the depth of the mix. Certain instruments are drier than others in the mix, and they sit on the front of this imaginary stereo screen. Other instruments are more ambient, or you have added um, a longer echo uh, delay to it, reverberation delay to it, and they tend to appear to sit, recede in the stereo picture. So when you do, when I think of a composition, I also think of where are these instruments located, not only in terms of an imaginary seating position, but what world are they living in? And when you have a m multiplicity of echo devices at your disposal, <clears throat> and you can create individual environments for these instruments to live in, you get to compose in a way that uh, goes beyond the notes, and goes beyond the overtone series, and goes beyond the other normal compositional things. You're building a world. You're building your composition 
can now be its own uh, personalized musical universe. This is beyond Klangfarben melody, for instance. It's far beyond that. Yeah. Right. But it's related to it. Definitely. It's the same principle that is I involved. Yeah. You see, in, in, in normal tone color melody, the instruments like, uh, I, let's take Webern, for example, big space in between the notes. It's a dramatic element. And I love to listen to that kind of music. It's great, because you concentrate on what does that instrument sound like. But an idealized performance of Webern has yet to happen, because a lot of the places where the Webern has been recorded were not interesting sound spaces. And so when, the, when you have that exposed flute, or one tiny little thing over here, that one tiny little uh, tenor sax note, you hear it, and it's in a boring room. You know, and I, if I were producing uh, the complete works of Vapor, and I would certainly take a different approach to it. I would have, you know, you want to hear the tone color melody? Well, let's color it up. Don't you feel that that, that would be something for you to do, actually? What, to, to type it in? Well, no, but to produce a, a recording of Vapor in, in, with this idea behind it. Who would pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to hear my version of Webern? Only me. Oh, I'm not so yeah. sure about that. Yeah, you can imagine. You know, I go to Deutsche Grammophon. Hey, listen, guys. Why don't you pay me to do yet another version of the complete works of Anton Webern, or even the, the complete work, works of uh, Verez? I'm going to take you up on that. I'll go, I'm going to go there and ask them. They'll go, a guy from rock and roll producing this for our esteemed German record company? Henning, you must be out of your mind. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs>